end of the chapter today. Genesis 2, 18. As you're turning, um, before we read the scripture, let me pray for us. Holy God, God of the universe, eternal God, Heavenly Father, we approach you today acknowledging who you are. You are holy. You are other than us. You are sovereign and in control. You are almighty. and We worship you today. We exist for you. God, we want to see your name praised. We want to see your name praised here. We want to see your name praised there. We want to see your name, God, praised everywhere. Father, as we come today into this place, no doubt, many of us are bearing heavy burdens of many kinds. God, by your grace, by your Spirit, through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, God, would you meet needs? God, would you let your word, God, just be like water to our souls? God, would you bring great healing and help and strength and joy, completeness in Christ to any of us who are dealing with any struggle in life? Meet needs according to to your will and your way. Father, as we come together as a body of believers in Christ, we acknowledge that many all over the world, especially in these days, are struggling. We think of what's happening overseas and in the Middle East, and we pray, God, for your, your hand of protection over your people, for you to bring peace, for you to bring justice, God, for those who need it, for you to bring salvation. We acknowledge, God, that this world is a very chaotic place, but God, you are in control. And we trust you for that, and we ask for your work, especially in these trying times. Give us, God, as your people, an eternal perspective of worldly events. Help us to see your hand in all things and to rest in Christ, knowing that a new heaven and a new earth is coming where peace will reign and salvation will be celebrated and you will be worshipped. And for that, God, we long for it. Our bodies groan for that. Our spirits groan for that. The earth is groaning for that. So God, we pray by your grace that you would bring that speedily. Have your way on this earth as it is in heaven. Bring your kingdom, God. So God, as we approach your word today, give us understanding. Give us ears to hear. By your spirit, do your work in our hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Genesis 2, 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the good word of God. We talked about, we talked last week about woman, but we dealt with really verses 18 to 21 ish, 22. We talked last week about woman being created as man's suitable helper. It was not good that he be alone. Being made in God's image with personhood and humanness. He needed someone like him to relate to, to rule with, to reproduce with. And no animal would suffice for that. None were made like him. So God made a woman to be a suitable helper for man. And the way that he did it, and that's what we're going to focus on today, the way that he did it teaches, teaches us so much about woman, and it teaches us so much about marriage. After no suitable helper or mate for Adam was found as he named the animals, God put Adam into a deep sleep, and he removed a rib from him, and from it formed the first woman. John MacArthur says this, he said that the word translated rib here is also translated side many other times, and MacArthur suggests that maybe God not only took rib, but took flesh to make the woman. I can see that. I don't know, but I could see that. I mean, Adam does say this at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, right? It says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, as if to put flesh where maybe flesh wasn't, regardless. We do know it was at least a rib that God removed from the man, and from it he made a woman to be his suitable helper and his mate. Contrary to what I believed at one point in time, men are not short a rib. Did you ever believe that? Did anybody ever hear that? Men are short one rib, women have one more rib than a man. I at one time thought that, but that's not true. Um, we all have, what, 12 uh, sets of ribs and 24 ribs. God taking a, a rib from Adam didn't change him genetically any more than, let's say you lost an arm and you had a child, your child would be born with two arms. You're not changed genetically. Maybe you're changed surgically if you or a kidney is removed, your child would be born with two kidneys. So he's not changed genetically. As a matter of fact, ribs, I found this out. I found out way more about ribs than I uh, intended to. But ribs regenerate. And so it's likely that Adam got his rib back. But he took a, God took a rib from man and... And, and created woman. God had already blessed Adam so much in the garden. Listen, there was beautiful trees that were pleasing to the eyes. They're not just good for food. They were, but they were pleasing to the eyes. Read the account. They were beautiful. To this time of the year, the, the trees are kind of starting to change right now, but they're going to change. And oh my goodness, they display glorious beauty and they're pleasing to the eyes. And, 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 and in the garden, the trees were pleasing to the eyes, but they were also good for food. Adam was blessed in this way. The tree of life was there that he could partake from. And he had delightful labor, not toilsome labor, not sweaty labor, not, oh, I got to go do this labor, but labor that brought him joy and was delightful. There was the exercise of dominion and he had vast intellect as he named the animals and all this before Eve was created. God had blessed him so much, but at last, at last, he says, the Lord God, the Lord God, remember the Lord God, that, that name in, intimates personal, <clears throat> excuse me, personal relationship. He's not just God, Elohim, transcendent God, he's Lord God, that's his personal relational name. At last, the Lord God showed great personal care for the man who was in great need for relationship with the crowning blessing 
by creating for him a woman, his wife, his suitable helper in so many ways. Pardon me for a second. (laughs) This is going to tickle me all service. This time of the year is something, isn't it? <clears throat> All right. So God crowns, the, God, God crowns his blessing to Adam with making woman and bringing him to her. The way God created woman shows us something. It shows us marriage unity. Marriage unity. That, that woman was made from man's rib shows the oneness and the unity that they share. She was made from him. She was a part of him. They were one. I love the ESV study Bible note. It says, quote, the text highlights the sense of oneness that exists between the man and the woman. Adam joyfully proclaims, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This terminology, the note says, is used elsewhere of blood relatives. This sentence and the story of Eve's creation both make the point that marriage creates the closest of all human relationships. <coughs> End quote. Adam and Eve, man and woman, are of the same bone and the same flesh. They are one. They are family. That she was made from his rib, the same stuff. It does indicate their unity and their oneness, But it also indicates their compatibility. They're fit for one another socially. They're fit for one another sexually. There is compatibility in their unity. Woman is brought to the man by God and it causes him... We don't get this in the English translation here. But it causes Adam to burst forth in an exclamation of poetry. In, in your version, this, what Adam says is likely set apart because it's a poem. MacArthur says it's the first love song. This at last, this at last is, 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 is an expression of exclamation. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Again, the English doesn't capture what many people say is happening here. It's an expression of excitement. Finally, finally, at last, one like me. The animals, it's, it's almost like there was this, as the, that God brought these animals to Adam. Yes, for him to name them, but for him to feel a sense of incompleteness. And he felt it. There was no suitable helper for him found. But when Eve was made, Adam didn't, wasn't even a part of that. He just went to sleep. And God made Eve. And he woke up and Eve was brought to him. God brought Eve to him. And he's like, at last. There was so much insufficiency. But now there's sufficiency. At last, one like me. She is made from him. She's made of the same stuff as he. She shares a sameness with him. and She's fit for him. She's suitable for him. There is a quote, as Matthew says, unique compatibility of the man and woman, end quote. And, and Adam's exclamation reveals that. Her being made from his rib, he shares with her a sameness unlike with any of the other animals. A sameness that makes her fit for him as a suitable partner and a suitable help. And their compatible sameness is reflected in what he calls her as well. Adam names her. Man is, the the, the word is ish. Woman is isha. Their names sound alike. They're phonetically alike. Just like man and woe man, there's a link there. So this phonetic connection... And their names is likely to show relationship and togetherness and connection and union and mutuality and compatibility as well. Warren Wearsby says this, quote, Her identity as woman would remind everybody that she was taken out of man, and the term man would always be a part of woman. 
Jack Arnold says, quote, God made woman from part of man, teaching man that if he can love himself, he can love a woman, for woman is part of him. End quote. So with woman being made from man, evidencing their unity, the marriage union is thus described in verse 24 as one flesh. As a man holding fast and cleaving to his wife. You get the image of of, of, of holding and clinging to, and there's and they're one in, in an not a, well a physical embrace, yes, but you get the image. They're one. God's design for the marriage union is one of close, intimate unity and oneness. So an implication for us. And if you're not married, don't check out on me because there's a lot that is in this message for you and in this passage for you. Maybe there's marriage in your future, and this needs to define what you're looking for. Maybe you need to pray for marriages now around you. And maybe you just need to see what God's ideal of marriage is so you can stand up for it in this culture. But for all of us, we see what God's ideal of marriage is. And at the end of this message, we're going to see how Christ, his relationship with us, is expressed in his design of marriage. But for us husbands and wives, are we fostering a sense of close relationship, of unity and togetherness in our marriages? Are we guarding against anything that would disrupt that unity? Are we guarding against sin in our lives that disrupts unity? It's not just her fault, it's not just his fault, what's going on with you? Are you guarding against your sin? Are you repenting of your sin that's causing division in your marriage? Uh, are we guarding against other relationships? I, oh gosh, I didn't plan to say this, but I'm really in the little house on the prairie right now. And last night after Steph went to sleep, I go to get my nightly almost bowl of cereal, and little house on the prairie is on, and I'm watching it, and it's the one where Charles is, is go, he's going... Oh, he loves Carolyn so much. But he's going, and, and he wants to get Carolyn some dishes. She needs some new dishes, and there's this widow, this attractive widow, and, and she's rich, and she's got some old dishes she's getting rid of, so he's doing some work for her to trade the work for the dishes. But Carolyn doesn't know this, and so Charles is white lying a little bit. It's going to be a surprise, and, 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 and uh uh, Carolyn's like, ooh, I'm catching him in these lies. What's going on? What's going on? And she's getting all, she's getting worked up over this. And of course, it, it ends well because she realizes what was happening. But there's that, that just makes me think about relationships in our lives sometimes that, that if we're not careful to guard against husbands having inappropriate relationships, even if they're not sexual, but inappropriate relationships with other women, or women having inappropriate relationships, even if they're not sexual with other men, that is creating a disunity in what's supposed to be unity? Are we guarding against that? Is our work disrupting marriage unity? Even our children, <laughs> as much of a blessing as they are, is the marriage primary. Any other distractions, we have got to guard against anything that disrupts the marriage bond and the marriage unity. If you're not married, pray for marriages around you. If you plan to get married, pray that your marriage is one of closeness and intimate closeness. All right, let's keep moving. This passage also teaches us about marriage roles. Marriage roles, and this is going to, well, it may not make any of you mad, but it'll make this world a little upset. Woman has already been described, along with man, as being one who is made in God's image. And she, along with him, is to exercise dominion over the earth. We find that out in chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. She is suitable for man. She's like him. She's made from the same stuff. She is equal to him in substance. Make no mistake, she is dignified. She is equal to him in value. She is not lesser. I raise my voice in that to emphasize that because what I'm about to say may make you think 
That, that is not true, but it is very true. She is equal to him in value. She is made in the image of God. Yet, in woman being made from man, we are intended to see this, that the appropriate roles in God's design for marriage are clear. Paul makes this connection. I'm going to flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to read um, verses 3 through 10. Um, this is talking about head coverings, and I'm not going to teach about head coverings today, but I'm just going to uh, uh, let you see this passage and see the connection Paul makes from Genesis 2 to what he's teaching here. Listen to chapter, three verse, or chapter 11, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife, the head of her, a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Listen, for a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but a woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Listen, verse 10, this is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. Paul says, man was created first, and in the marriage relationship, he carries the authority and the leadership. We see him carry that on in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. What we see from, man, from woman being created from man is that God is initiating appropriate roles in marriage. Man is the leader. He's the authority. He's the one responsible. The wife is to submit to her husband's leadership. And even in the church, the created order, man first, then woman, man created first, then woman, even in the church, the created order has impact on the issue of leadership. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. I, this is Paul talking again. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is why it is not biblical for a woman to be a pastor. In the family and in the church, and I'm not talking about government, I'm not talking about business, I'm not talking about other civil situations, for the marriage and for the church, the male is the leader. It doesn't discount a woman's role, it doesn't discount a woman teaching, she teaches other women, she teaches children, but in the role of a pastor, that is for men. God is establishing here, in the creation of man first and then woman, the, the, uh, the leadership structure in marriage and in the church. So I want you to note something. There are six ways here that, that show us the appropriate leadership structure. And I want you to know this. Because when you're debating this with other folks and when you're talking about this, when you're trying to understand it even yourself, you need to see that it comes from Scripture. Why is the man, why do we see that man is the leader? One, he's made first. God could have made him at the same time, but he didn't. Man was made first, so we are to see that man is given headship. Two, woman is made from man. Again, Matthew, I'll, I'll quote Matthew's 
woman has her source in the man, suggesting that the man is the leader, end quote. Number three, Adam began to express his dominion, naming the animals without the woman, suggesting his role as leader. He would need her help. She would exercise dominion with him. She would help him subdue the earth, but he was the leader. He started exercising that dominion first. This is a big one. Naming signifies authority and leadership. We see Adam named the animals, demonstrating authority, dominion, and leadership. The dominion God had given him over the earth, he starts to exercise that when he names them. Well, who gave woman her name? Adam did. She's different than the animals. She shares a different relationship with him, but she's under his authority. Woman is made as man's helper, not vice versa. No, this was before the fall. This was before sin entered the world. In God's good original design, the woman is to be the man's helper. Again, this shows his leadership. And number six, this is a, this is a big one too. If you look through Scripture, sin is said to have come through Adam. Who ate the fruit first? Eve. But in Scripture, sin coming into the world is attributed to Adam. Why? Because he's the leader and he's responsible. He's the responsible party in the relationship. Jack Arnold says, quote, It is the man who is ultimately responsible for, before God for the nature and character of the home. It is the man who must exercise leadership in determining the direction in which the home should go and must, therefore, be accountable to God for that leadership. The woman's responsibility is to acknowledge this leadership, end quote. So in God's good, original design for marriage, the husband is the leader and the wife submits to his leadership. But once more, let there be no misunderstanding. He is not more valuable than she. She is a suitable helper. I love what Ligon Duncan said. He said this, this idea of suitable helper, it communicates her role, but it also communicates her dignity. She is suitable. She is said to be a helper. Remember, we talked about last week, help, God is our helper. So Duncan says, quote, she is a picture of God coming to the aid and rescue of man, end quote. And men, don't we need rescue? What dignity Man needs woman as woman needs man, 1 Corinthians 11, 11 to 12. She completes him. God put him to sleep and made her. Adam didn't make Eve. God did. God made her in his image and gave her to the man as a glorious gift. She has much value. So her role as a, as a submissive helper is a divinely ordained, dignified role of great value. She's not lesser than he. Just look at the Trinity. Look at the Godhead. Look, look, look. Each person of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, in nature is equally God. One is not more valuable than the other. There, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. None is greater or lesser than the other. But relationally, listen, you see willing submission in particular roles. God sent Jesus. Jesus submitted to God, God the Father sending him, 1 John 4.10. Jesus submits to the Father's will, Luke 22.24, Hebrews 10.7. Father and Son send the Spirit, John 14.26, 15.26. There's roles within the Godhead of willing submission, but all equal in value, equally God. God's design designates particular roles for husband and wife without demeaning either. Like, I mean, if, if you, like me, watched that tragedy of a football game yesterday, you saw a, a, an example of this, right? If every member of that 11-man offense wanted to be the one that received the snap and threw the ball or handed the ball off or, or what? If everyone wanted that role, there would be chaos, but everyone has a role when the play 
is drawn up. Everyone is valuable. The one holding the ball is not more valuable than the one that catches the ball or the one who takes the defender this way so he doesn't catch. You know, you understand? Everybody plays a role. It's like that in marriage. There's designed roles, all equal in value. So implication one, this view of marriage roles is not popular in this culture, in this sinful, self-focused culture. So here's, here's the question for us. Will Scripture be your authority? Or will the cultural views of the day be your authority? Will you feel like you have to water down Scripture or explain away Scripture just so it's not so awkward in certain conversations? Or will Scripture be your authority and define how you think about marriage, how you communicate marriage, how you counsel people in marriage? This issue, I love this issue. Not because it's comfortable to talk about, but because it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that's, that feels just a little weird. It feels a little awkward. And I love that. Why? Because any issue in script, that Scripture brings up as truth and God's design and truth that makes us do like that makes us go, okay, where is my real authority? Where is it? And it gives us a chance to say, you know what? My authority is the Word of God, no matter what I think or feel about it. Implication two, husbands and wives, are you faithfully displaying your God-given role in marriage? Are you? Husbands, are you, are you bailing on your leadership just because you're lazy? Wives, are you pridefully trying to usurp your husband's authority? Husbands, are you loving your wives like Christ loves the church? If you're bailing on your role, you need to repent and follow Christ in that area. This passage also teaches us about marriage design. Marriage design, verse 24. God takes, the Lord God takes a rib and creates woman, brings her to the man. Man just poetically, oh, at last. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then, verse 24, therefore, I love this, therefore, there's so much in one verse, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In verse 24, we see what the marriage design is. Because the woman was taken from man, and they share a common unity and togetherness, it is on that reality that marriage is to be built. Marriage is a union of oneness that is to be primary and permanent. Two words, very important, primary and permanent. He is to leave his parents. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean physically, because even back in that day, uh, the man would stay in his house that was around his family, right? And, and it doesn't necessarily mean physically, because the woman was brought into his home, but it means that at, when he gets married, now his priority is not his mom and dad. doesn't mean he doesn't honor his mom and dad, serve his mom and dad, love his mom and dad, help his mom and dad, but it means that his primary uh, focus now is his wife and his children. He has to leave his parents, and he has to hold fast to his wife. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean a change in location, but a change in pri uh, 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 priority. He's most concerned with, now with his wife's welfare, their union. He is one flesh with her. This has major implications. How many times have my in-laws are out of town right now, but I'm not talking about them because they're good about this. But how many times do meddling in-laws in sometimes disrupt the unity of a marriage? A husband and a wife need to understand that it's leave and cleave, and in-laws need to understand that it's leave and cleave. He is to leave his parents, man is, and to hold fast to his wife. Cleave to her. This, communicate, this cleaving, this holding fast, communicates permanence and endurance of the marriage union. They're clinging to one another like glue, I'm telling you. I, I'm sitting here writing this sermon on Friday, and I can't get Huey Lewis out of my head. That song, um, 
Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. I'm so happy to be stuck with you. Yeah, I'm happy to be stuck with you. I'm stuck with you. Marriage is and I'm stuck with you. I'm clinging to you. I'm happy about that. That is God's design for me to be stuck with you as I cleave to you. They are to be one flesh for life. Y'all going to go download Huey Lewis after you leave here. I know it. It's probably the only time that during a sermon I was listening to a secular love song (laughs) on repeat. It's upon this verse, this verse 24 in chapter 2, that that Jesus teaches about marriage in Matthew chapter 19. Listen to Matthew 19. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him, listen, and tested him by saying, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another commits adultery. Jesus took Genesis 2.24 and said, this is why you don't divorce. This is why marriage is to be permanent, a union of permanence. And yes, in Scripture, we have two that I know of uh, provisions for divorce, and that is what Jesus just said, adultery. The other is if you're married to an unbeliever and the unbeliever leaves, you let them go. But other than that, and I know there's an issue of, there's some other issues that come up that we need wisdom in, but we need to approach everything scripturally. God's design for marriage is is for it to endure and for it to be permanent. Stephen Cole says this, romantic love is important, but the foundation of marriage is a commitment of the will. It is a covenant before God. He quotes Malachi in Proverbs. Commitment is what holds a couple together through the difficulties that invariably come. A Christian couple should never use the threat of divorce as leverage in a conflict. End quote. Permanent union is God's design. They shall become one flesh, it says. This is a callback to how the woman was made from man. They are literally one flesh. For marriage, this has major implications. A husband and wife are to be one. One new entity together that is expressed in their sexual union. One flesh certainly shows the physical sexual union. But that sexual union is the expression of the husband and the wife becoming one in mind and purpose and direction in their loving union and kinship together. As one, they are, I'll quote Matthews again, dependent and responsible toward one another. Ligonier Ministries says, quote, becoming one flesh suggests God honoring intimacy in all areas of the relationship, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, and the like. To achieve this intimacy, husband and wife must follow the roles God ordained for them in His Word, end quote. So here, I've only got a paragraph here, but we could preach this for days. But here in Genesis 2, God's design for marriage is set forth. Listen closely. This will go fast, but it's heavy. It's dense. Here in Genesis 2, God's design for marriage is set forth. Marriage should function in intimate unity and oneness between husband and wife. God made only one wife for Adam, not many. So no matter what the practice has been over the ages, even by our Bible heroes, polygamy, multiple wives, is not 
God's design, nor should it be practiced. One wife, one husband. We see here God's sexual ethic set forth. Becoming one flesh sexually. Doesn't Paul even say that if you sleep with a prostitute, you become one flesh with her? So, sexual activity is a, is a uniting of flesh. So becoming one flesh is only to happen, hear me, between one man and one woman in the context of a lifelong, monogamous, heterosexual marriage. This eliminates homosexual relations, bestiality, Scripture deals with it, sex outside of marriage, and adultery. An unmarried couple living together is not God's design. Same-sex, quote, marriage is not marriage and is a sinful abomination to God. God's original design has much to say against divorce and how flippantly husbands and wives move in and out of the marriage for unbiblical reasons. Open marriages are sinful. Adultery is sinful. God's original design leaves no room for marital abuse or dishonor, for both man and woman are made in God's image. Marriages that are just coexisting without close companionship and relational unity are not fulfilling God's original design. We could go to so many passages to deal with all this stuff, but we won't. We found the foundation of God's sexual ethic and marital design presented here. So, a few implications, and let's get to the gospel, and we'll be done. Implication one. Culture is trying to redefine and justify so many sinful ideas. So many sexual expressions, so many perspectives on marriage, and the church must boldly and clearly stand for God's truth, God's design, and God's purpose. Perversions of God's pattern for sex and marriage deface His good design and are sinful. God designed marriage and appropriate sexual relations. We don't get to redefine them to fit our sinful desires or our desired situations. Implication two. I told you it was heavy. Sorry. Not sorry. Implication two. Do you need to repent as a husband or wife for any expression of perversion of God's sexual or marital design? I'm not blind to the fact that even in marriages perversions of God's design may be being expressed in various ways outside of the marriage. Husband and wife, do you need to repent? Implication three, pray for marriages in our congregation to be healthy and biblical. Now, this marriage topic brings up different issues for some, for singles, for Christians, maybe married to non-Christians, maybe widows, I just want to commend to you, I'm not preaching it today, but I want to commend to you Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. All right, let's close this thing up. This passage takes us to the gospel. And for that, I want to read the, the full passage of Ephesians chapter 5 and comment on it as we close. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 32. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. As Christ's bride, the church submits to him. He is our bridegroom. He's our head. He's our authority. He's our leader. A godly wife models this submission to her husband in marriage. Christ, in great grace, gave his life for his bride, the church, to make her his bride, that he might be one spirit with her, united to her, nourishing her, sanctifying her, presenting her blameless. Did you not see the gospel here in Ephesians 5? Jesus loved his church and died on Calvary's cross to bear her sin, that she might be forgiven, that you as a member of his church, if you're a Christian, might be forgiven. If you're not a Christian, God wants to bring you into the church through forgiveness of your sin. He died for your sin. All of us are sinners. We deserve a fiery, eternal hell of God's wrath for our sin is what we deserve. But Jesus came on Calvary's cross and died, and God was pouring his wrath for our sin on Christ. And Christ was winning our salvation so that, and he was risen on the third day, so that we can look to a risen Savior now and say, ah, oh, I can't save myself. I need what Christ done for my, did for my sins to be forgiven. I'm turning from my sin. I'm placing my faith in what Christ did for me. And at that time, God brings you into the church. You become a, a, his bride. You become a part of his bride. And, and, and he declares you righteous so that on that day... When he returns, he can present you faultless, blameless, spotless, forgiven, righteous. Jesus, as our bridegroom, gave his life for us in great love. So a husband who is one flesh with his wife, united to her in the togetherness of marriage union, is to sacrificially love her like Christ loved the church. And does not a woman who is yielded to Christ herself and who sees a husband yielded to Christ and loving her like Christ loves the church, is she not chomping at the bit to follow his leadership? Because she knows he is working for her good. And she knows that in doing so, she is obeying God. So in our marriages functioning biblically in this way, we present an example to the world of the relationship of Christ to his church. Discussions of marriage are opportunities to share the gospel. And when we realize that our marriage roles in a biblically healthy marriage, functioning in God's good design, model Christ's relationship with the church, thriving in those roles is a great joy and a great honor for his glory. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. You did not leave us to ourselves. In grace, you came to save us. In grace, you give us your word, your design. In grace, by your spirit, you lead us. In grace, you have given us your word. Thank you. God, I pray for repentance, where repentance needs to be. I pray for healthy marriages all over this congregation. I pray for singles who are to get married. Would you prepare their minds for what marriage is to be, what their spouse is to be. Let them look for that spouse. Lead them to that spouse. For singles who have the gift of singleness, Lord, I pray for your grace for them. For those who have divorced and who are feeling a sense of incompleteness, God, let them be fulfilled ultimately in Christ, but follow your instructions there in 1 Corinthians 7. For widows, for those hurting, when the issue of marriage comes up, 
God, give grace, give guidance, give appropriate blessing where you would. God, let all around our congregation there be biblically functioning, healthy marriages for your glory. And may your church in this filthy, adulterated culture shine like a light when it comes to marriage and sexual ethic, shining your goodness and your truth and the glory of the gospel to a dark and fading world. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. We'll continue to chapter 3 next week, so you can go ahead and read ahead. Um, let me re just remind you, uh, choir tonight, uh, Wednesday night, we have activity.